Have you ever looked up into the tuning setup window with all those sliders and numbers but you never fully understood what they do and how are they gonna affect your car's performance? If so, you're in luck, because in this video I will explain them to you with the help of some animations. Then we're gonna tune some cars together to give you some examples of how to approach the setups for every surface type and track so that you can be able to tune your cars to better fit your driving style. But first of all, make sure you set your wheel and force feedback right because these two things play a very important role in your overall performance. For Logitech G29, G920 and G920, 923, you can try my settings here on screen or you can pause this video here and watch my other video in which I explain how to set up your wheel and force feedback so it better fits your driving style and only then you should start to think about tuning cars. Now let's talk about tuning. Alignment is a setting that allows you to modify the angles at which the wheels are pointed, vertically which is camber and side to side which is toe. So, no camber means that the wheels stay perfectly vertical, which ensures a full contact patch between the wheel and the road. Negative camber makes the bottom of the wheel stick out, reducing the contact patch between the wheel and the road. And positive camber makes the top of the wheels orient to the outside. This is something you will never see in motorsport, as you can see the game doesn't even allow you to set positive camber. Now you may ask yourself, why do we need camber if it reduces the contact patch between the road and the tire? Won't this compromise grip? Yeah well, here's the problem. When cars take turns, the tires deform due to centrifugal forces that shift most of the car's weight to the outside, thus reducing the contact patch between the road and the tire. So if you apply some degree of negative camber right from the start, the negative camber from the outside wheel will correct the deformation of the tire caused by the turning action, resulting in a full contact patch and maximum grip on the outside wheel when taking turns. While yeah, on the inside wheels, the effect will be increased even more, but they don't matter that much during turns, because as mentioned above, the mass of the car will shift towards the exterior, so the outside wheels need to have the most grip when cornering. The front wheels will be affected even more, because they also pivot left and right when taking turns, so typically the camber value will be higher. As for the rear wheels, the deformation is influenced only by the car tilting side to side during turns, so a lower value will do the trick nicely, but it should never be set to zero. As you can observe, most presets start with the rear camber set lower than the front camber. While it may take away a little grip when going straight, it will add a ton of grip when cornering. You gotta find a balance between these two values. Don't go overboard adding a ton of camber because you will risk losing control on straight lines and shallow turns, but also don't leave it to zero as you will have a harder time cornering. My recommendation is to analyze the track first. For tracks with tighter turns, you should add more camber, as you will not go straight for a long time anyway. And for straighter tracks with fewer turns, go for smaller values to maximize the grip on straights and shallow turns. Next, go for a few runs and make small adjustments as needed. Toe is another alignment feature that adds to a car's ability to go faster during turns. No toe means that the wheels are perfectly oriented straight. Toe out or negative toe makes the wheels orient to the outside and toe in or positive toe will orient the wheels to the inside of the car. Toe angle will cause the wheels to slightly drag over the asphalt and depending on the setup it can assist in many ways. For example, toe in on the front wheels will increase stability because having the wheels pointed towards one another will create a centering effect. But a bigger value will induce understeer because in this configuration the car tends to resist turning. Toe out on the other hand will allow the car to get better through the corners because the inside wheel is already pointed out in the turning direction and will want to drag the car in that direction. But again, a bigger value will do worse because the outside wheel will be oriented away from the turning direction and will want to pull the car in the opposite direction, this way counteracting the turning motion. Now, in the rear, towing will again increase stability under throttle, trying to prevent the car from wobbling side to side, leading to smoother corner exits, while tow out will help with the rotation of the car mid-corner, because the inside wheel guides the car inward, creating a rotation effect, but a bigger value will try to rotate the car too much, causing oversteer. So again, start with lower values and adjust accordingly. My favorite setup is to have some tow out or negative tow to the front wheels for better cornering, while on the rear, so tow in for better stability on corner exits. Now, what is oversteer and understeer you may wonder? Understeer occurs when you want to follow a specific path through a turn, the green line in this image, but the car doesn't and the trajectory widens to the outside potentially leading to a crash. While oversteer does exactly the opposite, the trajectory tightens, pulling you towards the inside of the corner and possibly causing the car to spin out. Now, I'm not gonna go too in depth here on how the differential works, but I'm only going to tell you the essential stuff. If you want to learn more about differentials, there is an incredible video explaining this, I think it's over 100 years or so, but for me it's the best out there, so I'm gonna leave you a link in the description. 
Now, the basic principle of the differential is to allow the wheels on the same axle to spin at different speeds. Why we want that, you may wonder. Well, when a car is turning, the outside wheel follows a longer path than the inside wheel, but they must travel along their path in the same amount of time. So this means that the outside wheel with a longer path will have to travel faster to accomplish this task. Another important aspect of the differential is how power is transmitted to the wheels. Now, here we have three sliders for both differentials since this is an all-wheel drive car. The abbreviation LSD stands for Limited Slip Differential. Driving lock engages when throttle is applied. Braking lock works when the car is coasting with zero torque being sent to the wheels and under braking. And preload operates when little to no torque is applied. Preload is particularly effective during corner entries when you begin to lift your foot from the accelerated pedal. Let's look at this example. Let's say we have a real wheel drive car with one of its wheels placed on an ice puddle. On a fully open differential, when we press the accelerator, all the torque is going to be transmitted to the wheel with less resistance, which is the wheel on the ice. Thus, the car will remain stationary, while a fully locked differential will ignore the difference in grip between the two wheels and it will transfer power to both of them equally, causing them to rotate at the same speeds. But as we discussed above, this is not really ideal when cornering. So a higher driving lock will improve straight line traction by equally distributing power. However, on corner entries, a higher lock will result in more understeer since it prevents the wheel from spinning at different speeds. While on corner exits, this approach will help to get you out of the corner much faster. But beware, with a higher lock on the back wheels, if you're not careful enough with the accelerator pedal, the car may oversteer and spin out. A low differential lock is not recommended at all. As you drive around the track and the car leans from side to side through turns, over bumps or crests, the center of mass changes constantly, redistributing the weight of the car from one wheel to another. As we said above, an open diff sends torque to the wheels with less traction, meaning that the car will become uncontrollable. A higher braking lock is beneficial when braking in a straight line. In the event of one wheel locking up, the other will be forced to slow down by the other wheel through the differential. But never go for a fully locked diff, because with both wheels locked under heavy braking, you will plow out the corner and maybe crash. Wheels generate traction only when they rotate, so that's the purpose of the ABS, to prevent wheel locking so the rubber grips on the road to try to stop the car, not slide on it like a sled. While a lower setting on the braking lock will induce a yaw moment in the event of one or the other wheel locking up, which may lead to loss of control. The last element to discuss is preload, which induces an understeer effect on corner entries when you begin to depress the accelerator until releasing it all the way. So this option is active for small amounts of time and only in specific circumstances. But in this case, the understeer effect induced by the preload can facilitate smoother cornering with less effort if you set it right. This is because in some turns you will get more oversteer and the understeer given by the preload will try to cancel the oversteer effect, helping the car correct itself and navigate the turn smoothly. If you set this all the way to 100 Nm, don't worry, it won't lock your wheels or anything like the driving lock or braking lock wheel. It will just give you more understeer, while on the lower side you will experience less understeer on some corner entries. So take your time and find your sweet spot. So, damping. At first glance, this step may look intimidating, but let me clarify it to you. The damper is one of the two components that make up the suspension system. Slow bump and fast bump. Do you think they have anything to do with how fast you're going? Slow bump will mostly absorb the bumps from the road surface, while fast bump will mainly absorb the jumps. As you can see in the third row, you have a slider that allows you to adjust a value expressed in meters per second, which is also a speed. That speed refers to the rate at which you hit the ground, indicating the speed at which you fall, not the speed at which you're traveling, alright? Ok, so a softer slow bump will absorb bumps better, preventing the shocks from being transmitted to the car body, but the lower you go, the stability may be compromised. A firmer slow bump will enhance the stability, but more shocks will be transmitted to the car body. Too firm, the entire front and rear end can lift off the ground compromising the stability, while a bigger bump will be able to tip the car over if you hit it fast enough. Go take it this way, the rougher the terrain, the softer you should go. Personally, I never set the slow bump above zero, I always stay on the softer side, even on asphalt. Fast bump will take action mostly when jumping, it's good to have a softer setting to effectively absorb them. But set it too soft, you will hit the bump stop upon landing, meaning that the damper will compress all the way with no more room to absorb the jump. So the rest of the shock will be transmitted to the car body resulting in loss of control. Too firm can also result in loss of control, because the fluid in the damper will resist compression, sending most of the shock further into the car body. So this setting has to be adjusted accordingly to the jumps present on the track. But because we have slow and fast bump settings, with this one I will always stay more firmer to aid the slow bump. 
Now, the bump division slider allows you to adjust the magnitude of bumps absorbed by the slow bump and by the fast bump. This basically allows you to find the balance between these two settings. As I said above, these meters per second refer to the speed at which you hit the ground after jumping. So take it this way, the bigger the jump, the higher the speed you will get. Adjust the slider to a higher value and only the big jumps will be absorbed by the fast bump. Opt for a lower value, now even the bumps will be absorbed by the fast bump. The last setting is slow rebound, which is quite straightforward. Rebound determines how quickly the damper extends in the event of the car lifting off the ground when hitting some bumps and jumps. A softer setting will allow for faster extension, so as soon as you lift off the ground when jumping, the wheels will be pushed down remaining in contact with the road, allowing you to have better control upon landing. On the other hand, a firmer setting will resist the extension, so when jumping or hitting bumps, the wheels will not be pushed down as fast as before, thus reducing the time they stay in contact with the road. Like with the slow bump, I do not recommend a firmer setting, I personally prefer the softer side of the rebound. Here, all three settings are really straightforward. The braking force setting allows you to adjust the amount of force applied to the brakes. A higher setting increases the stopping power and reduces the braking distance, but can also lead to more lockups. As mentioned earlier, lockups lead to loss of control and reduced grip, so don't go overboard with this setting, especially in low grip situations like gravel and snow, where even a little push of a brake will lock the wheels up. Brake bias allows you to adjust the distribution of braking force between the front and rear wheels. Usually, in every car out there, you will notice that the front brakes are larger than the rear brakes. This is because when a car is braking, its weight will shift more to the front. This is also why you lean forward in a car under braking. So this mass shift will load the front wheels more, requiring more power to stop the car. But this fact adds some benefits. The increased weight on the front wheels will provide more grip, while the rear wheels will lose some of their grip, so braking more with the front wheels will result in a greater stopping power and easier cornering. But in low grip situations like gravel or snow, the mass of the car won't shift that much to the front, because the stopping power will be lower, as well as the stopping distance. Therefore, excessive braking on the front wheels will not be as beneficial as on asphalt, so you can adjust the brake bias a little more towards the center than before. But Regardless of the surface, you should never set the bias lower than 55%, because the rear wheels may easily lock up, causing the rear end to drag across the surface and potentially make you lose control. And finally, the handbrake force. The higher the force, the greater the stopping power will be. The handbrake operates only on the rear wheels. So personally, I like to start with a higher setting, then work my way down to ensure just the perfect amount of handbrake on the rear wheels to allow me to rotate the car when needed, such as in a U-turn, square turn or any other situation. The gear ratio refers to the difference in speed between the input gear, which is connected to the engine, and the output gear, which is connected to the wheels. A lower ratio will allow more torque to be transmitted to the wheels, promoting acceleration, while a higher ratio promotes speed. This enables the fine-tuning of how much speed or acceleration you want to have in a certain gear. For example, if there is a sequence of turns and you constantly have to shift between 3rd and 4th gear many times, just increase the 3rd gear ratio so you can achieve greater speeds, allowing you to navigate those turns without constantly shifting, which can waste a lot of time. The final drive scales all the gears. Scale down and you will have high acceleration potential, increase the final drive and you will be able to achieve greater speeds, but the acceleration will be reduced. You can analyze the track a little before the race. If you see a lot of turns, opt for a smaller final drive ratio to regain speed quicker after cornering, or if the route is pretty straight with fewer turns, go for a higher ratio to achieve more speed on those straightways. Also, don't forget to check the elevation, as the race may be mostly uphill or downhill. In an uphill race, a shorter final drive will be beneficial, because now the force of gravity is also dragging the car back, so more torque will be needed to push the car uphill. The right head slider lets you adjust the ground clearance of the car, so you can go over the bumpiest terrains without scraping the ground or damaging various components. On smooth asphalt or not so bumpy dirt tracks, you may go with a lower ride height, as the surface of the road is mostly flat and you want to take advantage of that low center of mass. However, by increasing the ride height, you will also raise the car's center of mass, which is not a very good thing, especially when cornering, as it will also increase the chance of tipping over. But at the same time, a higher ground clearance provides more suspension travel to better absorb all the bumps and jumps present on the track. For an asphalt track, start with a lower setting, whereas for a dirt or snow track, start with a default or even a higher setting. Go for a few runs and adjust accordingly. The spring is the second component that completes the suspension system. It is mounted over the damper, hence the term coilover, and also aids in the absorption of bumps. 
Adjusting this slider to a lower setting will improve the absorption of bumps, but setting it to low and you will reach the bump stop after a jump, sending more shocks into the car body, possibly leading to loss of control. While a higher setting will allow for more stability, especially when taking turns. But on rough terrains and big jumps, it will make things worse, because the springs will resist deformation, so the car may bounce back into the air, resulting in a huge loss of control, potentially leading to a crash. Personally, I never felt like adjusting this slider more than 2 or 3 pips up or down. The most precise suspension adjustment will be made from the damper step anyway. And last but not least, the anti-roll bar, or ARB. This is a bar that sits at each axle and connects to both wheels and the car body. This bar also works like a spring, absorbing the body roll of the car and some of the bumps. A strong setting will absorb the body roll induced by the centrifugal force when cornering and transferring it to the wheels, particularly the outside ones. A downside here will be that the inside wheels can lift off the ground overloading the outside tires and in the worst case scenario causing the car to roll over and crash. On a lower setting, the car will be allowed to roll more but too much roll will make it unpredictable when cornering as its weight shifts freely in all directions making it harder to control. However, the absorption of bumps will be increased as it will allow more independent movement for each wheel. So it's up to you here, set it softer for greater bump absorption or rigid for more controllable corners but with less bump absorption capacity. I recommend a stronger setting and focus more on tuning the dampers, springs and ride height for improved bump absorption. Now let's recap. Camber lets you correct the patch between the wheels and the road. Toe allows you to adjust stability, understeer or oversteer for better cornering. LSD driving lock adjusts how torque is delivered to each wheel under acceleration. LSD braking lock adjusts the coasting and braking torque delivery. LSD preload induces an understeer effect at corner entry. Slow bump absorbs mostly bumps. Fast bump mostly absorbs the jumps. Rebound controls the extension of the damper and bump rate allows you to set how big of a jump or bump will be absorbed by which damper setting. Braking force dictates the peak braking pressure under a full press of a pedal. Braking bias adjusts how much braking pressure goes to each axle. Handbrake force again will set the maximum force that is applied when pulling the handbrake. Gears allow for fine tuning of how short or long a gear will be to promote either acceleration or speed. Final drive scales all the gears up and down. Dry height adjusts the ground clearance of the car. Spring rate helps the damper with bumps and jumps absorption. And finally the anti-roll bars or ARBs control the body roll of the car. Now let's apply these guidelines and tune some cars to give you some examples. But before we proceed, if you already found value in this video, please take a moment to hit that like and subscribe button to show your support for me and for this channel. Thank you! Now I know that most of the hype is around Rally 1 cars, but for this guide I will opt for a Rally 2 car. And if you're a beginner or even more advanced, I suggest you do the same and start with something less powerful. This way you can focus more on how the car feels after each adjustment, not on how to keep it on the road because it's too powerful. For the sake of learning. Once you understand and master each setting, you can gradually progress to more powerful cars. Now I'm gonna choose 3 tracks that are not very familiar to me, one for each surface type, asphalt, dirt and snow. This way it's more natural, I can be subjective with the tuning settings and the track feels as new to me as it would to you. For the asphalt location, I'll choose Central Europe. It's the location I'll play the least and I'll choose a relatively shorter track with a suitable number of straight end turns. For the first run, since we are on asphalt, the job is simple. Tow out on the front wheels for better cornering and tow in for the rear wheels for better drive out of the corners and stability. This way cornering will feel like child's play. Next, I will add some camber because from the map on the left, the track appears to have a handful of turns. The differential looks pretty good, but I'll add a little bit of preload to test the corners. Since this track is asphalt, the tempers will be set more on the stiffer side. In the braking tab, I will only add some handbrake pressure to get a reference on the turning power it offers. And then, I will gradually lower this setting until I'm satisfied with how the car rotates. The gearbox seems fine, requiring only small adjustments for now. In the springs tab, I will lower the car all the way down, which will lower the center of gravity and minimize the body roll, also aided by the stiffer ARBs. Now let's head to the track. Three. After the first run, I already noticed some weak bump absorption and too much handbrake force. In 
run to, I notice too much understeer on corner entries, so I will slightly lower the differential preload. Slight right, slowing 100, turn, square right, don't cut, 70. With the preload now on lower setting, it's time to soften the ARBs a bit because I can feel excessive sliding on some turns. Caused by the tendency of the inside wheels to lift off the ground, putting too much weight on the outside wheels, overloading them. Now lowering the ARBs did very well, there is no more sliding on corners, however I still feel some unwanted bumpiness even though the track looks pretty smooth, so I'm gonna raise the car a few millimeters to allow for more suspension travel. Way better now, the car now glides from corner to corner effortlessly. So I believe that I have a strong base on the suspension side. Now I might increase the braking pressure a little more, uh, add 2 or 3 pips to the front brakes and lower the handbrake force again, as it still locks the wheels too hard which causes the car to rotate too early before hairpins. Now everything feels really good, I might adjust the final drive a few notches up to be able to achieve faster speeds and lengthen the 4th and 5th gear. During the last 3 runs, I decreased the camber value for both front and rear axles because I felt some instabilities on the shallow turns and straights, plus made small adjustments to the gearbox. So after the very first run which ended in 780th place with over 38 seconds of difference between me and the first place, I believe this setup performed quite well, placing me in the 38th position with less than 10 seconds of difference and after only 10 runs on this track. Next is the dirt track, for this one I think I'ma go with Italy. Before the first run, I'll apply the same torque configuration and lower the camber. Differentials seem fine for now, maybe I'll add just a little braking lock to the front diff. Since this is a dirt track, I'm gonna soften the dampers right off the bat. I'll shift the brake bias more towards the front and jack up the brake pressure to test for any locking. For the gearbox, I lengthen the gears just a little for some extra speed and lower the final drive to get better acceleration because this track has some thirst here and there. And in the spring stab, since I don't know how bumpy this track is yet, I'm just gonna stiffen the ARBs and that's it. Following the initial run, I have to lower the final drive because this track is mostly made out of turns, with the last third being also a climb. This configuration will provide more torque for better acceleration. After the second run, I will soften the dampers and the rebound just a little for increased stability. Square left, half long. Square right. Now everything feels pretty good on the suspension side. I need to adjust the brake bias slightly towards the rear wheels and increase the braking pressure. I did experience some locking due to excessive braking power from the front wheels, so shifting some of the brake pressure to the rear wheels may slightly compromise the stopping power. But that's why I raised the brake pressure to compensate and test if I get any more locking from now on. I'll shorten the 4th and the 5th gear just to get a little more torque because this track doesn't have enough trace to allow for excessive speed anyways, so I want to focus more on the acceleration. Over the last 5 runs I made small tweaks to the gearbox, springs and alignment, so after the 10 runs this is what I came up with. From the 705th place on the first run, seeing this track for the first time, I ended up in the 17th place with just over 14 seconds of difference, so this setup works like a charm. From now on the improvement will come mostly from learning the track more and more and how many turns I can cut without getting a penalty. And if you wanna criticize me for this line, just head over to racing.com and compare the times with others and you'll see what I'm talking about. The final track for this example will be on snow and since this video was filmed during Rally Sweden, I'm going to race in Sweden. This track will do nicely so let's start with the initial tuning. For the first run I'm gonna adjust the toe angle again and add more lock on the differentials to get better traction. Remember the example with the ice paddle? I will soften the dampers a little because these tracks are usually bumpy. On the brake step I won't apply too much pressure because these are low grip conditions and I don't want to lock the wheels. I will adjust the gearbox for balanced torque delivery for now. And on the spring step I will just stiffen the ARBs for a more controllable body roll and head to the track.
Okay, so I underestimated the track a little. I need more ride height and I have to lower the final drive to allow for more acceleration since this track is way more twisty than I expected. Titans 5 on 40. 3 right, keep in. Up. 4 left of the crest, opens 40. The car felt definitely better, but since there are a lot of small jumps and bumps, I want the wheels to be more in contact with the road, so I'm gonna do some damper adjustments. 50, 4 left, keep in, 100. 3 right sharp, up, 6 left. Run 3 felt way better, but there is still some need for softer dampers and raised ground clearance. 3 right, 30. Oh yeah, definitely better now, but since this is a very twisty track, I need way more acceleration, so tuning the gearbox for more acceleration is a must. Also more camber is needed, because there are just 2 or 3 straights, so I'm more interested in corner traction than straight line traction. To be honest with you, I had a hard time on this particular track, with all that white, so I did 15 laps on this one, just to get a better hang of it. So in the last runs, I focused more on the suspension, gearbox and differentials, to be able to get the most traction and stability out of this setup. Now I can finally say that I have a solid base, from which only small tweaks here and there will be needed. Since this setup placed me in the 36th place, with just little over 12 seconds lower than the first place, I can say that the rest of the improvement will come from learning the track more and more. I want to thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you enjoyed and found what you were looking for, please click the subscribe button and like the video if you haven't already. Also don't forget to leave your thoughts in the comments. I know there are some settings on certain cars that I didn't cover in this video, but I'll be happy to explain them to you guys in the comment section as well. See you on the track, bye bye!